Hi, my name is Jung Simonoff. I wrote the opening poem for Giving Voice to Image. This is a wonderful, wonderful exhibit and a chance to hear different poets' voices and see how closely they become attuned to the works of art that they are writing about. And I'll start my poem. It is called An Opening. Canyon Road is covered with snow. Dead of winter comes alive inside. Parallel lives gather in a room of images. Describe your dream. Colors, sounds. What comes first? The vision. The phrases, letters dancing, a dream of color defies words, a shape that is at the same time. When did the marriage of word and image begin? Late night, early morning, crowning, coming out whole or incomplete. Our stories visit at night when we go home. Your visions talk to each other on the walls. We are all dreamers of the same dream. You may know what lies ahead, or do you, like me, long to find those pieces that fit in the score, the orchestration of our lives? This is the way to start a poem, a blank page. An invisible knowing lends itself one word at a time. Gestation, it takes as long as it takes. We begin. It flows out, spills over without a vessel to catch it. A torch, a chisel, a ration of ink, a piece of coal, a brush, a sponge, a hand that dares to smear color. It broods, festers, explodes in a glorious burnished array. Or is it so dark that a single pin of light is its only hope? Our music sings voices to art. Dreams in the darkness give birth to the light of day coming out whole, mulching in the cave of the artist's mind. The melody of words waltzing, images of long dresses and formal suits. We got to this holy city wandering in the desert with brush, palette knife, set of pastels. All the words we told ourselves becomes a feast set out before us. It is the same river we all bathe in, our mouths echoing praise. Rejoice, be in it, of it, in praise of it. In the middle of this desert, our words give voice to image. My name is Gary Shellcross, and I've been invited uh, to participate in this fourth Voice to Image uh, program. I've written a work, a poem, uh, based on a body of work by Patricia Pierce. This body of work uh, involves books and parts of books that Patricia, Patricia uses uh, to make sculptures and collages. And the title of the poem is The Book Rescuer. A book no more, yet still a book. That most revered and sacred object named book, representative and holder of knowledge, key and symbol of civilization, the holy conduit through which we hear the ancients. When book is destroyed, the gods weep. The burning library in Alexandria, the burning books of Nazi Germany. We're skittish to fold even a corner of a page. We wince as a dropped book's binding breaks. The book rec rescuer's recontextualization is a boon to those books waiting for the trash heap with little hope. But the rescuer's work is oft misapprehended. She subjects the sacred objects to a vicious trial. The defendant is dyed, dried, distressed, waxed, withered, and wrecked, beaten, bruised, and bullied, contorted, coerced, crushed, and tortured, torn, and tinted, stripped and soaked and sutured, and then, and only then, can it be ripped, flayed, and dissected, bleached, and bound. The resurrection has already begun. The bones are covered in gold, silver, pewter, Burgundy, rust, pink, and mauve. 
The alchemy of transforming base metals to gold is child's play for the rescuer. Hers is a more arduous task, turning the sacred into the divine. Thank you. I'm Barbara Rockman. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Ilsa Bowl uh, on this Vivo project, and it's been such a pleasure. It's the third year that I've been involved with the image and uh, poem project, a wonderful collaboration. So I spent uh, a long afternoon in Ilsa's studio talking to her and wandering among her inspiring works. And then I came to the gallery and sat on the floor for almost two hours in front of this particular piece. And um, what flooded into my writing were childhood memories, the news of the refugees, the news of terrorism and war in the world, um, thinking about girlhood and, and what women do to survive in the world. And this is the poem that resulted. It's called what women's hands make of white matter. A woman unearths what's rooted, scrapes dirt from what she will cut to meager stew. Into an iron sink, she unloads potato, onion, leek. Nails split with starch and stink, fingers rich as tubers. In a yard, a girl packs snowball after snowball until she's amassed a wall, a room from which she will watch nightfall. A woman in a cobbled alley shreds sheets. She will crumple and press into bomb-ripped flesh, what will redden as she bends to the fallen. Somewhere, a girl unravels a paper ball studded with sequins. Cake and song, long white strips ribbon the floor as trinkets fall. A tiny soldier, red star, miniature scissors. In a makeshift village, another pulls pillows from under the heads of the dead, what she will plump and slip beneath the living. In the city, a sculptress mixes pulp and seeds, dries paper, she will crush and shape. Rusting peonies spent boutonnieres settled into a vase. On a wind-whipped plain, a mother in a tent packs down fur, lint. What will mattress her infant? Unwritten pages, wings bound to her back. Above, a surveillance of clouds that swell and shrink like searchlights, sweeping imminent danger, possible relief. I'm Morgan Farley, and I was paired with Linda Picos Clark, who painted the marvelous painting behind me called Entropy Liquid. All of um, Linda's paintings have entropy in the title. This is um, a theme that she has followed through uh, many sequences. And so, of course, that's what I chose to write about. And I looked into entropy and discovered that it's a uh, a process of deterioration and disorder in a closed system. And after talking with Linda and uh, discussing her process with her, I realized that um, she really engages very vigorously with the process of entropy in the physical world of the painting. And she does that in order to engage with it in the social world and in the soul. The art of entropy. She speaks in silver leaf, marble dust, geometries of blue, and always 
The shapes mean more than they say, or less. Always the paint drips, breaks down, loves what does not last. Entropy undoes the world, undoes the art. Yet she courts it with thrown turpentine, with crumpled plastic dragged across the grain. Disorder drives her. She flirts with chaos, drapes it in Italian gold, undresses it to nakedness. She is searching for something that might hold. A pattern meaning rest, a god inside the cloud. I was luckily paired with Warren Keating. My name is Elizabeth Raby, and I'm very honored to be part of this project. I spent a lovely couple of hours with Warren looking at his paintings, deciding uh, what I felt was important about them and about his process, which is fascinating. We hurry through our lives intent on our business in the images Warren captures, he makes us last forever. Although we don't realize we have been caught, still anonymous, but everlasting in his paintings. <clears throat> Moment. Someone passes beneath the Parisian balcony, is captured in a nanosecond click of the camera. The unsuspecting passerby will never know he is now immortal at least as long as this pixelated image exists, transformed in bright oils onto canvas in an ever-intensifying swirl of detail. Most of us leave even less of ourselves behind, unknown but to our own small circle. But don't you see? We matter. We make a difference. A brief shadow on the pavement beneath the brim of a hat a forward step in a shiny brown shoe, under a bright sky or in pouring rain, here we are on our unique and only journey. Won't you stop, look, think about him, about you, about us, before we pass forever out of sight? My name is Daryl Williams. I'm going to be reading a poem called Excision, based upon a work of Vincent Faust by the same name. Vincent uh, works in steel and industrial materials and brilliant colors, and he contrasts that with some of the more somber tones of the landscape. And so the two fit together in a beautiful way. Excision, cut from steel, hammer, anvil, fire, pounded, twisted, bent into a skeleton. I gazed through ribs, thorax, chrome yellow. It will not melt into the desert floor like faded bones of a frightened deer or iris arc into the ochre cliff. It stands firm, strong, defiant against soft hills forged in fire on their own ancient anvil, now dissolved into the arroyo with each cool summer rain or garlanded under velvet of new snow until both cascade, rivulets destined for some faraway place. It tests my strength. I cannot lift it, turn it in my hands, capture hidden glints, only look from a distance, ponder meaning hidden in a lifeless shell, created by a sentient being.
My name is Mike Burwell, and I wrote a poem to Barry Brown's uh, piece, Then to a Distant Shore, right here. This is the third poem I've written to one of her pieces, and um, we're a good team, because I'm really intrigued by the depth she gets out of this medium. I've had fun writing stories to these pieces. So my poem is called, The Shore Will Open. Spring, dawn's touch rubs clouds gray, then pink. Sleeping dunes rattle with first wind. Tide flats open, round memory back to a softer time, pushing pushing out the barren muscle of inland winter. So the man traveling here leans to the motion of seagrass, abandons his mountain life, wanders nights with a lantern through the dunes. My name is Shuli Lambden, and I worked with Andrea Broyles. And in looking at her work, a lot of her work in her work in progress, I was really struck by her exploration of the human body, the human figure, and the spirit, and the big mysteries of how we come together, um, body and spirit, um, where we come from, where we're headed, and also a lot of classical references. Um, so, I have the poem, Somehow We Arrive. Not from soil or stones, not seeds, nor, not larvae or the sticks on which they spin themselves into cocoons, nor do we emerge from gold chrysalides like the winged ones. More like seawater taking the shape of salt in the ocean or the breath of wind in the air. Somehow, we show up with heads and limbs, thinking we know everything and nothing, the human figure, or just enough to become ourselves and then leave. Vague contours in old clothes, something torn or creased, folded just so, ready for the bonfire. We think we know how we leave, but we don't.